for well, the well, universe. One of those things more powerful than the universe, but oh my goodness, what a ride. Thank you very much, Carmen. <laughs> so, so I was sitting in the corner with our late speaker, and there were whispers around about what, who he had offended today, um, <laughs> that he had to call <laughs> out the guy who shows us the world, um, <laughs> so, the, the universe. Um, so, so Aaron is a poet most of the time, and he does some other things with his book his free time. And uh, he's going to come and share with us a little bit about how he sees oh, yeah, the universe yeah. and how he makes it possible, and, and how he finds a little bit of beauty in that. So once he figures out what he's going to read to us, no, I think yes, do you want to sit? Oh, um, I'll yeah. sit. I'll, I'll okay. Thank you. Thank you, Julian, and thanks everybody for for being here. This is for the recording. So. Oh, sure. Okay. This is dreadfully formal. So what that is? Uh, yeah. Okay. So you will close your focus. Great. Thanks, and thank you, Kara, for that. Um, poets like to think that you know we don't lose our sense of wonder ever, and that's hard to do on some days. Uh, especially in the middle of the week, but in the middle of the week, I guess, <laughs> when, when we meet you, you know, there's always a way of, of retaining that sense. Um, and what I thought I'd do is, is start off by, by thinking about how some poets, at least, have looked at the world and the bits of the universe that you've tried to describe. And, and it stri struck me as, as you were you're sh showing us all those wonderful things that th this piece by... Um, the wonderful Polish poet Wisława Zimborska was actually quite appropriate. And I'll, ex I'll read it, and then, and then I think you'll have a better understanding why I think it's so appropriate. It's called Falling from the Sky, and this is how it goes. Magic is dying out, although the height still pulse with its vast force. On August nights, you can't be sure what's falling from the sky, a star or something else that still belongs on high. Is making wishes an old-fashioned blunder if heaven only knows what we are under? Above our modern heads, the dark's still dark. But can't some twinkle in it explain? I'm a spark, I swear, a flash that a comet shook loose from its tail. Just a bit of cosmic rubble. It's not me falling in tomorrow's news. That's some other spark nearby having engine trouble. You know, and I think Zimborska captures that wonderfully, right? That we, in some ways magic is dying out, but every now and then we find it. And the great thing about technology, of course, is that it's helping us to do that more and more each day. The other thing that, that poets do, of course, is they try and, where they can, immortalize at least a little bit of the vast universe. Just a tiny sliver, because they know that words are always going to be dreadfully inadequate for everything that's out there, in all of its glorious, gory complexity. And, and this is an effort that I had, you know, 20 years ago or so, to try and capture another aspect of that vast pulsing force that Zimborska talks about. And this piece is called Landing Plains, written at Changi Beach in 1995, so almost exactly 20 years ago. In the night, Sown so tight, sky and sea meet in silent mutual agreement. The tiny dot grows from sequin to searchlight, filling the black mass of shimmers in the sea. The light of fallen stars illuminates a road for those who would rendezvous with an unlit tomorrow. A motor's gradual chug whispers, then screams past. The air, once tingling with excitement and boiling over with shining spirit, turns suddenly cold. And I have to say, that's kind of how I felt after, I, after you finished. <laughs> like, what do you even do <laughs> to, to follow that? And I don't mean follow it in terms of speaking, right? But what's left after you've tried to e explore so much vastness and so much size that even our sense of what size is starts to, to get challenged? And then I realized that actually lots of poets have answers to that. The answer to vastness is to go so small and explore the minuscule and find the universes in that. And I think that's quite powerful. Um, Khalil Gibran and Derek just reminded me about this section of his wonderful book, I think The Prophet. Um, he's got a section in it actually called The Astronomer. 
And I think this is a, is a, a wonderful link to what I just described, right? The fact that when we are completely overwhelmed by the vastness out there, sometimes we find lots of comfort in the vastness of the small. And here's what the astronomer tells us, or rather what Gibran says about the astronomer. In the shadow of the temple, my friend and I saw a blind man sitting alone. And my friend said, Behold the wisest man of our land. Then I left my friend and approached the blind man and greeted him, and we conversed. After a while I said, Forgive my question, but since when hast thou been blind? From my birth, he answered. Said I, And what path of wisdom followest thou? Said he, I am an astronomer. Then he placed his hand upon his breast, saying, I watch all these suns and moons and stars. And I think what I want to do with the rest of, of the pieces I read tonight is really explore that, right? The suns and the moons and the stars that we find when we go really deep down rather than high up. And I think that given the fractal nature of the universe, there's going to be a lot of similarities, actually, between the very large and the very, very small. This is not a full piece that I'm about to read. It's, a, it's an extract of a piece I call Remembering Jalan Kayu. Um, some of you will know that Jalan Kayu is you know, somewhere up in the northeast. Very famous for Prata, yes, yes. <laughs> if you, if for no other reason than that is why it's famous. Um, but it matters a lot to me, not just for the Roti Prata, but because I was born there, on a little road called Edgware Road. So not Edgware Road, London, but Edgware Road, Singapore in what used to be the British uh, camp area, you know, where the, the officers of the British military used to live. And I don't remember a huge amount about growing up there, but I have these slivers of memories that come back every now and then. And I wouldn't even call them memories, because I'm not sure what they are of. You know, and, and I describe in the, poet, uh, in the poem here how sometimes moments rise above recollection and remembrance. And I think when they do that, they also avoid being forgotten. They're somehow not trapped, but they're kept in this immortal space forever. It's a poem in five sections, but I'm only going to read you section two, because it's a, that is a section about size and dimension. As far back as I remember remembering, our playgrounds were never very expansive. Under the dining table, hiding in cupboards or making dried leaf roja in the drain outside. Those were the games of our 1980s childhood, our created toys. Though we had our share of dolls and soldiers, of kites and playing catching in the field, mostly we found that interiors were not inferior. Before learning about size, shape or dimension, we discovered worlds etched in splinters, stones and the sliver of light through nearly closed doors. Children's minds drawn to children's proportions and the possibilities in small spaces. Of course, sometimes we remember the very small daily things, not just through actions, but through the people that we experience them with. And the next piece that I wanted to share with you is called Housemate. It's something I wrote for uh, the friend that I spent a year uh, rooming with when I was in the UK on postgraduate studies quite recently. It's a time that was very replenishing after 10 years or so of work. And again, it's a piece that goes very deep into the small rather than thinking about the large things that, that are out there. And it's actually it's got some connection to the Zimborska piece because the epigraph of the poem is from one of her pieces. It starts with, I owe so much to those I do not love, which is a line that she uses in a piece, piece called Thank You Note, you know, where she talks about the importance of the people we do not love passionately and with all of our soul because sometimes it's those people that keep us sane. So this is a piece for Leo. I said to you once that society is poor in metaphors for friendship. Somehow our poetry fails when some would say we need it most. Moments of gratitude that we can do our washing together, that we are comfortable staying in pyjamas on days too slow for words. When in the kitchen we no longer ask who cooks or washes up. When we discover that we both don't like salt in our food. Enjoy organic chocolate with sugar replaced by wild Zambian honey and yoga. When one of us cries to the other about love ending before even a chance to begin. 
when we talk about things not yet categorized, analyzed, or fully articulated, safe in that small space between us, crafted for the vague, formless, intuitive. I feel this most on nights we meditate together. In the dark, heartbeat warmth, slowing breath, all the reminder we need of life's comforts if only we find the space to listen. Afterwards, I learned that turning on the lights too quickly can be sharp, blinding. What need is there for metaphors or any seeing when everything that matters can be heard, when I feel on my shoulder your gentle hand? So that speaks about very, very daily realities. And I think what I find about my poetry, at least in the last year or so, is I've been going much deeper into what happens when we explore the small and the daily or the quotidian, and how many universes we find between them. I'm finding, for instance, that the religious poetry I used to write, which was you know, all about the big things, right? Skies and mountains and landscapes, have now been replaced by a lot more tiny detail. And this is a piece I wrote called Friday Prayers. Um, so I'm Muslim, even if I don't look it, or even if my name doesn't suggest it. Um, and this is a piece I wrote on Friday, the 3rd of January. So the first day of school this year, right, 2015. And it was a day that I decided to, to take the day off from work, just to let myself experience what the year was like before the stresses of, you know, and madness of, of work rhythms began. And I think it's a, about a space as small as small can get. So here goes Friday prayers. I follow a clutch of schoolboys in. Their shoes, left outside the mosque, shine like the first day of school, before the year's stains, scuffs, and sullies. We pray as we always do, language hush to a whisper in hopes we might actually hear you, seeking grace, knowing, vaguely, that it comes as much from right ritual and routine as it does from gifts like new shoes, white bright as all the steps we might take in the coming year. And once I wrote that, I started to think a lot more about other details. I mean, again, the simple daily things that we come across. And there was a morning when I was walking to work, and I saw what I thought was an interesting phenomenon, because it was a rain tree, like one sees anywhere in Singapore. A rain tree with the branches bright gold with sunshine. The leaves somehow weren't lit, but the branches were. I'm not sure I figured out the physics of that yet, but it probably isn't as hard as some of the physics you were sharing with us. But what was very profound about that, I thought, was perhaps this is the tree and its own language, right, and how it, it speaks and communicates with the world. So this is a piece called Walk to Work. There is a time every morning when you send tendrils of light to the wayside trees. Leaves whisper in hushed shadows, while filament ferns grow, glow golden on the dark of bark. On most days I pass these by, but today I must have stumbled upon a perfect light angle. Branches outspread, shining heavenward, and I learn again that all things have their language of praise. As you can tell, you know, the, the themes of spirituality, not necessarily religion, religion, but spirituality feature very strongly in, in the pieces I write. And one of the daily realities for, for Muslims is that we, we pray five times a day. And what I found is that there is a wonderful physics about that process. That's something I tried to capture in this next piece, which is called salat, the Arabic word for, for prayer. In standing straight, bending down to touch my knees, then ending each raka'at in homage on the ground, I find that spot beyond all sight or sound. Around the body's pivot, the moments of each day reach equilibrium and balance, stillness beyond dimension in a fretful, twisting world. Five times daily, some force that is and transcends mass, distance, matter, isolates that point where all life's fulcrums meet. Gravity suspends. Perfect stability wrought in human hands and mind 
and feet. What I've been finding also, you know, quite apart from you know, the importance of the daily realities, right, is the space that there can be in the silence around us. And that's another aspect of the universe that I think we underexplore. And what I've often found is that words are so inadequate for any poet, right? Because we're trying to find ways of reflecting the colour and complexity of reality that we never truly do anything but approximate. And, and, and words become really important in that uh, respect. But it's even more important what lies beyond the words. And this next piece, which I wrote in Petra Jordan, tries to explore some of that. What happens outside of language? It's called Standing Still. Here I learn that even stone has its language. Standing here where rarefied mountain air slices bone and evaporates the need for words except the toughest, most spare. I discover how quiet eloquence can be, hearing stone tease and immortalize civilization's first girlish blush. Hewn pink, red, brown, compel humility as I pass treasury and tomb and know my own silence, watchfully preserved, is born of something more than fatigue or breathless strain. Standing here, I brush shards of knowing that space is sometimes just the lack of sound. And why these spaces, this stony syntax, is what God chose for chronicle, canon, and commandment. Why to places like this we bring our most quiet prayers and wordless pleas. As if in otherworldly silence there is some whisper of what we seek. When freed of the world's static, God's word grows loud and the silences, his and mine, For those of you who've been to Petra, you probably you might recognize the term treasury. Um, and it's, how many of you have seen you know, that wonderful fourth, or th is it fourth, third Indiana Jones movie? Uh, <laughs> the Last Crusade, you know where he goes to look for the Holy Grail? There's this one great scene where he rides on horseback with his father and a few of the rest and they go through this valley and then they come to this beautiful pink piece of uh, sculpture. Right? Big building carved into the mountainside. So it's actually real. That is Petra, Jordan. That's a building called the Treasury. Um, a wonderful place. It's not actually, it doesn't go back as far as they, they pretend it does in the movies, of course. You know, but the, the edifice is there, you know, built by the Nabataeans back in the, the I, th I can't remember the exact century that it, that it was built in. But mountain merchants building a space where they could operate an entire civilization built out of stone. And the place now is a place of great quiet and of wonderful meditative calm that I thought was worth trying to at least capture, if not fully preserve. I'll end with the most recent poem that I've written, uh, and also one of the longest that I've done for, for quite a while. This was a piece written in a monastery, a Benedictine monastery in the Big Sur Mountains, south of San Francisco, south of Carmel, south of Monterey. And it's a group of about 20 Benedictine monks who live there. They're about 1,300 feet up in the, the mountains. And so above the, the monastery is Redwood Forest. Across from the monastery is the Pacific Ocean. And it's a space of deep, deep and profound silence. It's also a space where, in, on the first few visits I, I went there, I found that I was drawn to the big things. The landscapes, the ocean, the roar of the of the sounds. But this last time I went, in July, that was the third time, I found that I wasn't really interested in those things anymore. I was interested in the little dandelion that I saw on one of the walks I happened to do. I was interested in what the palm fronds looked like. I was interested in the grasses and how they swayed or didn't sway. I was interested in how the light came in through the chapel of the building. All the little micro-universes that were nonetheless extremely large and just full of detail to explore. So this is a piece written in eight parts, each capturing a slightly different aspect of the place. And I've dedicated it to Cyprian and James, who are two of the monks there that are extremely good friends. The, the epigraph of this poem, or kind of the introductory quote, is a, uh, a piece from the 44th Psalm 
that the Kamaldolis monks, uh, you know, th this community, use for their morning and evening prayers, so lords and, and vespers. And the line of that is, My heart overflows with noble words. To the king I must speak the song I have made. And the title of this piece is A Song I Have Made. Part 1, Vigil, which is the morning prayer that they do at 5.15. And it's actually quite easy to wake up at 5.15 when you live in a monastery because you'll go to sleep at 10 because <laughs> there is nothing to do um, after you've meditated three times. So anyway, Vigil. From you and from this place, I learn what gentleness means. The hermitage bell wakes me without clang or clamour sidling into early morning dreams on eyelid flutter, like a favourite memory of an insufficiently remembered friend. Part 2. Silence. I learned that silence is everything, not nothing. We arrived late in the evening, fumbled into our cells with all the finesse of urban life. Leaf crackle, piercing the night. The next morning, I heard how silence sounds. Bird song, blue jay caw and call, ocean swash and backwash like genderless rhymes above the echo of distant cars. Between vigil and lords, I think I heard the receding tinnitus of crickets, ever softer with warming day. Part 3. It's called Contemplation. You tell me that contemplation means more than just rumination in extended time. I suspect this truth will take a while to tame, but I am starting nonetheless towards a frail, tentative understanding when I notice a spider trapeze my line of sight while I shower, feel its web on my cheek after just hours away from my cell, watch the chalk swirl in the water I boil for tea, Listen to tea splash and the poetry I always knew vaguely. Now, finally, there is time to wait, watch, and witness. Part four is called meditation. It mentions the word vesper. So the, the, the monks pray four times a, a day. Right? They do vigil in the morning at 5.15. Lords, which as I mentioned, is the morning prayer at 7. Um, they do a full mass or Eucharist at 11. Then they work for the rest of the day and they come back together for Vespers at 6, which is the evening or closing prayer for them. Some monasteries will do a night prayer as well, but these guys do that privately. So when we meditate together after Vespers, my palms finally unfurl like lotus petals on my knees. During previous visits, for whatever reason the mind makes up, it seemed wrong to open my hands to even a fraction of this place's love and largeness. I cannot name what now has changed. Perhaps the benefit of knowing that some gifts we simply hold a while. Stewards, not owners, of preciousness undiminished, even magnified and multiplied for being shared. Part 5. Music. All of their prayers are sung in Gregorian chant. I notice the simple ache of your singing. Single notes, uncluttered rhythms, few multiple harmonies or music in the round. These may well have their own beauty. On other days, I've wondered if anything but polypart voices can sing the unsayable. Yet somehow your melodies seem built for Pacific sturdiness and redwood sentinels. And then there is the place you keep for broken voices, notes and moments when our choir falters and somehow someone pulls us back by staying true. Perhaps this was how Elijah felt, learning that God comes not through storm, structure, or perfect symphony, but still, small, insistent songs. Part 6 is on photography, and all my completely futile efforts to capture some of the detail of the place. Because you can only capture that tiny fractal fraction of the place. But anyway, we try, right, with whatever we have. So this is that section. On earlier visits, I found myself drawn to the sky, sea, and mountains, the familiar canvases God chooses for his ever-renewing story. This time, I'm shown the miracles in the minuscule. Bees on daisies, bluebell droop, pines perpendicular to unlikely slopes, solitary dandelions whispering stories to the sun, 
benches overlooking the edge of the world. Lone stalks of grass and grain holding firm against the wind and weathering of the world. In them I discover the scale of the small, blessed insignificant inheritors of both the earth and the divinity there can be in details. Part 7 is called Icons. And this I was quite fascinated by because my, my friend uh, Cyprian told me that icons, you know, those beautiful pictures of religious art are not painted, they are written. And so when you see a, a Madonna and child, right, particularly the ones in Byzantine kind of fashion with, the, with that interesting gold filigree and, and, and geometric spaces, those are all written, not painted or drawn. It's just the verb that they use, right? They, to make them, they write the, the icon. Yeah. So someone will never tell you, I've drawn an icon or I've produced it. They will say, I've written an icon. So I was delighted by the idea that icons are written, not drawn. For a poet, this means the blue of Madonna robes, profound as the ocean, and the expressiveness of her eyes are not images, but noble words. Yet thinking again, maybe the labels don't matter. Word images or image words are all treasures of grace anyway. The names will fade, leaving only our experience, their example, and those long gazes into eternity. Finally, part eight, postscript. Something I wrote after I left the monastery this time. There were many songs to speak after my first visit. Yet overflowing hearts sometimes compel a slowing of words, moving us to savour more, dig deeper, ponder just that much longer to see what's revealed between the words, spaces pulsing with meaning. We start to hear the music in the rests. Three visits, two years, one poem later, I find faith in new melodies hope for new time, love for the future. But for today, gratefully, still I must speak. This song, not so much that I have made, but made through me. I'll leave you with that thought. Um, those were the pieces I wanted to share. Pieces that explore the terror and the wonder in the tiny. Which I thought might be an interesting compliment, Carter, to the vast spaces that we explored before. <laughs> so there we go. Yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay. Are we going to yeah. question? Anyone? Yeah. Sure. Comment. I thought it was ironic. I'm not sure you even saw it go by, but when you were when you were reading about it, just passing right behind it. Ah. <laughs> Well, there was clearly a moment of synchronicity there. Then. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it's passing by you now. And, right. And, and, uh, mm. and then also, uh, when you mentioned Big Sur, that was passing right behind you. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't even have to plan it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's, yeah. Nice. So I have yeah. a question about Petra. Excuse the banality of mm. it, but is the treasury, is that just a notional name, or was it no, I think it really was a treasury, yeah. And they have other, other you know, the, the surviving buildings that were used for different things as well. Um, not many as beautifully and perfectly preserved as the treasury, though. Yeah. And it's in this gorgeous pink that just yeah, reflects no, the I sun amazingly. Yeah. I have been fortunate to see it up close, but I certainly seen the yeah. picture. Yeah, so it was actually a treasury, I think, where they actually you know, came and exchanged goods for money or goods for goods. Yeah, so it's a place of financial exchange. Do you uh, plan uh, when writing your poetry, or is it sort of on a whim? Um, I won't say it's on a whim, but you know that, that the last line that I read, right, that the poem is not a song I have sung, but that is made through me. I am getting increasingly into a believer, right, becoming more and more of a believer that all art is a gift through which the artist is a medium. And it sounds like a terrible cop-out on some, some levels, right? Because I have no control over what I say. Um, and of course, that's not entirely true, right? There is a sense of crafting. There's a sense of the more you make an effort 
and you know, put some rods out there, you will actually get struck by lightning every now and then, or struck by inspiration. Um, but I won't say that I plan. I, I let inspiration hit me at least a few different times. I collect fragments. So I'm a bit of a magpie in that sense. I'll just collect lots of things, write them down somewhere. And then when I have the time, when my mind has had sufficient space to still, then usually the piece will come together. Yeah. Does it mean that you don't need to um, redraft them? It's like, you know, it just flows and then you don't have to correct that, That's a good like question. <laughs> I think the, so the, the, w when I talk about songs made through us, I'm talking really about that first initial draft, right? That act of, of birthing or of creation. After that, there's a huge amount of refinement and growth and editing that takes place. And I often say to the, the, the people I work with on their own creative writing that you almost need two different brains for the writing bit and the editing bit. And successful writers need to know how to toggle. The good thing is, whenever you have writer's block, the easiest thing is to just go back and work on a piece that's already there. But the key thing is to always write, I think, regularly. Every day if possible, but if not, then at least once a week, just to get the rhythms and the muscles flowing. Because writing is a muscle. And if we leave it, it will atrophy. Yeah. Like any discipline or craft, I think, it's a muscle that has to be developed. I draw so much similarities with the poetry and my programming. Like Great. I, I can yeah. go and uh, either maintain my open source yeah. projects or create new ones. Yeah. And when I have block for to create new ones, I just maintain yeah, it absolutely. and close bugs and yeah. issues. Yeah. The other thing that I find really useful <laughs> is if I'm having a block and I don't have many pieces to edit, mm -hmm. is to help other people with theirs. Exactly. Right? So teach someone, mentor someone, or just go and, and work with someone so that you at least keep the language of it moving in Do your you mind. Do you write them out somewhere online that we can go and uh, check? Or um, some of the pieces are online, yeah, like quite a number of them. Are. Um, I had a book out about 10 years ago, 2005. Um, so those pieces are in a hodgepodge of different anthologies. I'm slowly putting the stuff together into a blog because I've been much too lazy about getting a second book out. <laughs> yeah. I have it there, it's, you know, it's all in my head. I could, no, the thing is, a publisher is willing to take it. I've just, oh, okay, right, right. I need to go and get approval from bosses and stuff, and I just haven't <laughs> got around to that yet. This is the problem when the writing is very much a hobby and something I love rather than something that pays the bills. <laughs> and I wouldn't change that for the world. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so I watched a TED um, video by, about where is home by Pico Ayer. Mm. And he, he mentions. He does. I, I actually, the last time I met the Pico same was the, in that monastery. Is that the same it's one? The, exactly the same one. And oh. Pico and I email every now and then because we both love the place very much. He's actually read this poem oh, uh, before. Yeah. He was one of the first people I showed it to. So another moment of serendipity, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He goes there and all, he, I think he spends at least a year there, a month there each year writing. So it's kind of his it's retreat it's house. Yeah. Gets clarity of your thoughts. I think that's very much it, yeah. The stillness and that, that confluence of, of deep nature, but deep interior space as well. And you start to realize that you know, there is the divine out there in everything. The, the community is an interesting one because they are actually a community of hermit monks. So unlike most monasteries where it's one building and they all live in different rooms, they actually each have a cell to themselves with a little bit of a garden around it. So their whole rhythm oscillates between community and self community and solitude um, throughout the day. They pray together, but then they go off and be alone. They come back, and during the prayers, there's a lot of community singing, but then moments of silence as well. So the entire experience is of this constant oscillation between interior, quiet space, and active community space. Yeah. Yeah. They do, they do. So they're a Benedictine community, and all Benedictine communities um, part of their, the rule that they live by is to welcome guests as they would Christ himself. Mm -hmm. Because the guest can be you know, a form through which the divine comes to the monastery. So they are always open to, to guests if there's space. You know. So they, this group actually has quite a large number of rooms that are, um, are up for, for, I guess, you know, in a sense, rental. It's not, they're not quite a hotel, but you know, they, they're a great place to, to stay. And it's all online, so you can check whether they're available. No, so that's the thing. Uh, males can, only males can live in the monastic cloister. So if you want to book a, a monk cell, you actually have to be male. But everywhere else in, in their retreat house, it's for men and for women. Some monasteries are men only, but not this one. Right. Yeah. The name? Uh, new Kamaldali Hermitage. New, so as in not old. Okay. And um, Kamaldali, C-A-M-A-L-D-O-L-I. 
So if you look up www.contemplation.com, that's their website. Contemplation.com. .com. I know, totally, right? I've been teasing them a lot about that. It's like, why are you a .com? But they are. You had a question, yeah. Uh, religious procedure. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. it's the oh, here we go. Well, well, our friend during his master's in liturgy is not here. So, <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's all the, the, the Muslim norm of praying five times a day yeah. regardless, and then the Christians only doing so in monasteries as it happens. And so, what happens when you visit a monastery? How does that work? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I was describing my experience to a friend the other day who's also called Aaron and who's Jewish, right? And he just looked at me and went, so, so what kind of Muslim are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a really good question. So, I mean, yeah. well, I, yeah, I'd like to think that. So, I, I, this is where I should clarify, not clarify, but I share with you the, the slightly odd, quirky family that I come from. And at least one of you knows some of, of that, right? Because you know, my, my brothers, I have a friend of my brother's is actually here. Um, so, my dad is half Tamil, half Eurasian. So ethnically, very mixed. The Eurasians are the ones, you know, they, they have some Portuguese descent from the Portuguese that went to Goa and India and then Malacca and then came to Singapore. So dad was raised Catholic um, as a child. He converted to Islam when he married my mum, who is half Malay and almost half Pakistani and has a smattering of Chinese in her from a Chinese baby adopted by a Pakistani family and raised as a Muslim. This was my great-great-grandmother. So I actually have a blood deficiency that's generally a Chinese thing, carried by women and, and uh, you know, had by men. So I tell you all that just to say that it's a very, very eclectic upbringing that we've had. I am perfectly comfortable in churches because I've had to be there, right, for weddings and funerals and, and, and baptisms. And I do quite a bit of interfaith work, which is how I know Chulin. And so when I go to the monastery, what I found is there is a tremendous commonality of vocabulary. In fact, many monks would say that they have more in common with Islam because of the observance of, you know, the day punctuated by, by prayer than they might do with, with lay Christians who, who don't observe what, what is called the liturgy of the hours. Uh, so there's a huge amount of commonality there. Um, I will say and recite whatever I can of it as long as there's no contradiction. And mostly there isn't, to, to be quite honest. Yeah. So I do all of my own prayers, right? So the, the five daily prayers. And I will join in addition, and I do the four as well. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. Yeah. So it's an. I know. It's great. Which is partly why I feel so recharged when I get back. And then of course that energy just gets leached very quickly. But you know, I feel like I've stored up capital uh, after the the July visit. Yeah. I just really wanted to ask you something. Before I ask that, I just want to know that actually females are not to stay in the Carmelite monasteries. And this is a right. similar version to the Benedictines, yeah. where the nuns, uh, they cloister themselves off. Yeah. And those that cloister themselves off have very good interior life. So the question I wanted to ask you is, because throughout your poems, you are talking about vastness, and mm. then you go back into solitude and yeah. submission. Um, the question that I want to ask you, I don't know whether it's a two question for you to answer. Sure. But where are you right now in terms of your emptiness? Mm. That's a really good question, actually. And what I would say is this. I, when, when I go to the monastery, or when I've been to, to places that afford that kind of interior space, and certainly being in grad school was great for that because there was a lot of room for long walks and you know, just s sitting in a chapel or an empty room or just reading by yourself, and even that can be a deeply interior activity. Where am I in my emptiness? What I've realized is the emptiness, for me at least, isn't there as an indulgent thing. It's a place to go to to gather energy. It's a place to go to to find a bit more of myself. Right? The things that I wouldn't hear if I was outside and had a constant clamor um, pushing it at me. But it's to, it's to be in that space so that I can be better in community after that. And, and what I found is when I'm in community, that there is a different kind of fulfillment that comes from that. Right, so whether that's a commun the community of work or the community of family or the community of friends who also share you know, similar interests. But the interior space is important for that. And so what I try and do now is to make sure that I have what I call both micro and macro silences in my life. The micro silences are periods in the day when I make sure that I have a little bit of time to myself. And of course, this is a deep introvert speaking. Right? I am highly de-energized by um, large crowds that I don't know well. 
Um, although crowds like this somehow I feel like I know very well. And you know, we just explored the universe together. <laughs> so it's all fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, but the micro silences are important. So the, the five daily prayers are, are an important part of, form of those micro silences. Uh, morning yoga, a bit of meditation, either in the morning or in the evening, is also important. So those are all deeply interior times. Like I get up, I roll onto my yoga mat, and I will not open the door to my room until I've had some of that space. So that, I feel, gives me a little bit of, of, of energy for the day. I try and take a little bit of time at lunch just to you know, slow down, even if it's just five minutes of reading one poem from a collection that I might have in, in, in my office. That gives me a bit of micro silence. And then before I sleep, prayer has to happen and some kind of, of um, interior space as well. So I find that if I have those things, the days are survivable. In a week, I try and have Sundays to myself. So the rule I've set with my family is I will not leave the house on Sunday unless someone is born, dead, or dying, <laughs> um, or getting married. Right? So there has to be some major life anniversary, <laughs> death anniversary, I suppose, um, you know, to, to, to be had for me to come out on a Sunday. And I, I find that it's important because recharging of that kind gives me s a bit more strength to go through the rest of the week. And so that's uh, on the weekly cycle, right? Uh, slightly larger than micro silence. And then in the course of a year, I find that as, as long as I periodically travel and have a long flight to myself, and spend a bit of time in places like the monastery or other spots on the, in the world which are what I like to call my wellsprings, right, the places that give me deep energy, then that's my macro silence for, for the year. And I try and make sure that there is some punctuation of that throughout the, the 12 months. As long as I have those things, I'm, I, I feel I have enough emptiness yeah, to then go and exhaust myself in the rest of the extroverting life. Have you translated? Uh, have you... Can we hold oh, that until sorry. afterwards, perhaps, or do no. you have a bonus ticket? Okay, you have, yes. Sorry, we can chat after this. Yeah. Thank you, Ari. I, I, I hope we surprise you as the Earth always surprise you. The Earth always, will always surprise me. <laughs> oh, uh, so, so we had a little surprise.